So here it is, 1914. Uh, this was my first house in America, in Austin, Texas. How do you feel to be here again? Feels awesome. Brings a lot of memories back. You know, when I used to work here every day. And my day will start at 6 in the morning. I can show you. But it really means a lot to me to be here. It is with everything that started. I remember being struggling here, being not able to eat for one or two days. And, you know, even though it looks like an amazing place, sometimes I really spend like very sad nights thinking what to do, how to do it. So I definitely, um, I don't know, I'm happy they can come back and, and remember those things. They really brings me back to all the battles and everything that they face in America. My name is Sergio Diaz. I was uh, born and raised in Matamoros, Mexico. Uh, my childhood, my childhood was good. You know, I was born in like um, in a lower class family. I really. I uh, had an amazing childhood. I remember playing with my siblings and going out and playing with friends. And even if we really didn't have, um, you know, that many privilege, we were still like having so much fun. And I never noticed if we were like really glad or something, needed something. I'm just gonna share with you how my journey started. I studied all in public schools, all the way to uh, college. I was studying uh, international business in this uh, private uh, college in Matamoros. It was, it was very hard for me to pay my tuition. It got to the point when I was really, really struggling. The last year of college, it was, it was very hard. It was very tough for me. Um, trying to pay for and you know all the expenses you have when you're a full-time student so I remember uh, this is the last week of the final test ready to graduate so how it worked is the there was a building when the final test were ready all the students would take the final test in the same building so we were ready for the finals but I didn't pay for literally like three months or four months. So I still owe like a lot of money on my tuition. So I remember one day going to my panel uh, and and the counter being at the front door of the trace of the building. He asked me for my name and I was like giving him my name as soon as he saw it, he was like, Oh no no no, there is no way you can come into the building and do the final. You owe a lot of money, so until you pay, is when we're gonna let you uh, do the test. So literally, the counter was in the front door on the building. He saw my last name. He was like, "You owe like three or four months of tuition. You can't not do the finals. You just can't. You gotta go pay, and then you come." Show me the receipt and then you can come. I had no money. So, in my head, I was like, I'm gonna do it. So, I went outside, I was sitting, just thinking, 
how to do it to be able to do the finals. And then there was this clean lady and I started talking to her and I find out, I find out that um, they will open the building at 4 p.m. to clean two hours before uh, the finals were scheduled, which was 6 p.m. So the cleaning staff, they will come up at the building, clean the building, it's ready, and then it will close again. Then the counter will come up, unlock the, the, uh, the whole building, it will be the front door, ready to be charging, you know, for that. I will wait on the corner crossing the street to see when the cleaning staff will open the building to go and clean, and I will run, go, and hide in one of the restrooms. So the building was for three floors, and at the second floor is where I was able, uh, what I had to do the finals. So I would go to the second floor, all the way to the restroom, which was a single toilet, you know what I'm saying, those individual restrooms. And I will just definitely just lock myself in and wait there for two hours. After the cleaning people will leave, then they will lock the room. So by the time it was 6 p.m., I will come out of the restroom, I will go to the classroom and just do the test. I did that for three days. The final day, with the final test, it was on Thursday. That day, I did the same thing. Getting there at 3.30, 3.45, waiting for the cleaning stuff to go open the building, start cleaning, wait five, ten minutes, run, get inside the building and hide on the, rest, on the restroom. Like, you know, I was doing it for three, four days. So then that day, I remember I did the same thing, I left the room, and I was just on my phone. That day, around 5, something p.m., 5.20 I would say, the counter came, and I hear his voice, and he starts saying like, okay, I really have to go to the restroom. He walks, he starts moving the door, you know, trying to open the door. I was like, oh my god. So it started to get very, very nervous. I was like having an anxiety attack to the next level. The counter is trying to open the door. He called the cleaning staff, like, hey, where is this door locked? Is somebody there? And he was knocking at the door. And I didn't know what to do. I just remember me closing my eyes, praying, begging. God, don't let these people open the door because they will find out I was there. It will be just a terrible situation. The counter started like trying to open the door. Then he started asking the cleaning staff if they had the keys to open um, the restroom to unlock the door. So they started looking at the keys and I could hear how they were going through the keys and trying them. They were not able to open them. And by mercy and love, God, did not have the key to open the restroom. So at the end of the day, the counter was like, you know what, never mind, I'm just gonna go to the, to the restroom on the other floor. He walked away. Don't understand how much I thank God for that. I was literally holding it, just praying and asking God, please don't let these people find out I was hiding at the restroom. have the opportunity to move to America. December 18, 2012, I moved to Austin, Texas. We have a new president in Mexico, Enrique Peña Nieto. And it really, really changed everything. At 
that point, I was with no job, with no legal status, and I was by myself in America. Then I was able to contact somebody, and that person was like, yeah, you can stay in my house. You can stay in my house, and I mean, you can sleep on the floor. It was very tough that night, because I remember I cried. Because in my head I was like, I'm in America, and I'm sleeping on the floor. And in Mexico, I had my own bed. Is there waiting for me and it was it was just emotionally very very hard but I knew it wasn't gonna be like that for him this, this woman asked me hey how much money do you have with you and I say um, $1,500 which was my savings for a whole year in Mexico she said, it's kind of dangerous for you to walk with that money. So just leave it here in the closet, put it in the closet, and it will be good when you come back. Okay. She was like, okay, she was going to charge me 500 per month. And what I did is just basically start over in America. I remember getting out, looking around, seeing the city, walking on Congress Avenue, and trying to get a job. I was knocking at the doors, I was asking in business, I was just looking at markets, all kind of like stores, retail stores, but I did not speak English, so it was impossible for me to communicate to anybody. So finding a job, it was very challenging. After walking eight hours, very tired, I came back home sad and stressed. Without knowing what was going to happen in the future, I turned around and I tried just to, um, you know, get some money to buy some food. And when I go and look at the closet, the money was gone. for her to get, to get home and I was like, hey, um, have you seen my money? And she obviously got very upset. She was asking if I was blaming her on her, on her boyfriend, that the money was not there, which it was not that the situation. I was more wondering because it literally it was everything I had. So she got very, very upset to the point she was like, you know what, you cannot stay here anymore. And no, we do not have your money, so you have to leave. I remember walking to the living room, just sitting there, and being like, now I'm homeless too. I remember sitting in the living room, and it was this girl with her boyfriend making some enchiladas. And, um, yeah. and then they were making some enchiladas, and I remember uh, they were just like, hey, do you want some? And I was like, Sure. So they were super nice about it. I was eating enchiladas with them. And at the end of the day, basically they were like, look, um, I mean, you can stay in the living room. It's something that we all share. So I don't see a point why nobody will, I don't think, I don't think anybody will care if you just sleep in the living room. And that's what it happened. Next morning, I woke up and again, I went and I drank to find a job. And these three women were sitting right here. And they asked me something like, what is my money? Or can you give me money or something like that? I didn't understand it very well. The point here is like, I wasn't able to defend myself because I didn't speak any English. So they just looked at me and they started attacking me, trying to take my money. They were trying to like, you know, putting their hands on my pockets and everything. One of them, she was like huge. She was very, very big. So she started hitting my chest and the other two 
were like scratching my face. Then if you look over there from Carson Street, they started calling three, these three, six guys. Yeah, six guys coming. They were running, trying to attack me too with baseball bats and everything. And I don't even know how, but I pushed them away and I run on that direction where it was my apartment. So yeah, definitely was something very like scary. You know, like hard, but it happened. So yeah, definitely I remember very well. And it was right here, this bus station. So tell me what happened in this place behind you. Uh, well, I work in this market. Actually, that was my first job in America. Literally, I was walking for four or six hours all over Congress Avenue and down here on Riverside. And finally, I got to this market and I asked them if they have a job for me. I told them I was starving, I was hungry, I would do whatever kind of job they have for me. And literally, this woman, I remember her name was Norma. She was like, well, actually, I need somebody to be like putting all the fruits away and cleaning and I need somebody else on the freezer moving like, you know, the big meats and everything. So if you really need this job, I will give you the job, but you will do the two positions and I will just pay you for one position that she will pay me like $8 or something like that. So I was like, sure, you know, because I was starving and I was hungry. So she knew I didn't have papers and still, she knew about my situation. She hired me. She told me not to worry about it. I didn't have money for any kind of food. So I told her if there was a way she could give me like some money in advance or she could open like, like a line of credit or something for me to be able to eat here every day. She could discount that, you know, from my paycheck, which she, she said no, but she was like, you know what? I won't open a line of bread for you, but you can eat one banana and one apple a day. And that will be a way to help you. Which honestly, after a week, I felt like I was like a monkey or something because I was eating bananas all the time. But I definitely appreciate that because it really helped me to survive. Well, first of all, it was so, so hard to be doing two positions, you know? in like 12 hours shift but anyways i remember my back being on fire i remember being very very tired it was super hard to be going on, on on the freezer and then coming back to like this hot temperature and just like going back and forth and moving the fruits and everything anyways finally on friday i go with her because it was payday and she was paying everybody and when she goes towards me and she's like okay i was like hey so i'm here because it's payday so i'm here to pick up my paycheck and she looked at me and she was like, oh, I forgot to tell you, you're fired. And by the way, you have 10 seconds to leave the store. If not, I'm going to call immigration on you. So literally, that day I felt that everything was over. I literally felt that my American dream was gone. That's it. There is no way I can survive here in America. And I remember walking out through those doors, walking on this direction, and going to the bus station was right there, maybe you can see it. Sitting down there and just thinking, that's it, it's over. I don't even have money to survive here. I don't even have money to like go back home. So I remember I wanted to cry, but I was so sad I couldn't cry. And is there with this beautiful angel, which is this woman, look at me and she's like, are you okay son, in Spanish? And I was like, uh, do you know where I can find a job? That was my only word. And she was like, no, but you know what? Why you don't go to UT? There's a lot of students over there and you can just go over there and ask for a job. But you can find a job over there. And it's there when it really hit me and I was like, yeah, maybe, maybe that's the solution. 
So I asked her where was the bus station or where can I take the bus to take me to UT and she was like, you know what, there is an e-bus which means a student bus which is free for all the students. Go to the stop right there which is like one block from here, take the bus and just go inside. Like just go into the bus, don't, look, don't even look at the driver, just go and sit there because it's free. They usually ask for ID but they don't. So just walk like, just pretend that you are a student and literally that's what I did. Finally, I got to the uh, University of Texas and I remember walking there. I was very, very tired. I was hungry. It was cold. It was raining. So I just walked and I go inside to a cafeteria. And, you know, it's like this small plaza where you see different restaurants and you see students walking here and there eating. So I was very, very tired. I was very weak. Just walk and sit down there and I remember seeing there just honestly just gone. I was very desperate, I was very tired. I remember this this guy was eating this pizza and I saw him just eating one or two slices and then just grab the pizza and throw it out the trash. Honestly, I was like, did he just throw away the pizza? So I was starving. I was very tired. I didn't think twice. I walked straight, grabbed the pizza from the garbage, and I ate it. the most delicious pizza I have ever had in my life. I still remember it was like Hawaiian style with pineapple ham, you know, those kind of things. It was the whole pizza there. So I started eating it like crazy. And after eating it and saving the rest, I was sitting there and somebody started touching my shoulder. So when I look and I see I see this old guy looking at me saying, I saw what you did. Damn. Just look at him. Man. I remember tears coming out of my eyes and telling him, I'm alone here and I just start telling him everything. I just opened my heart to him, started crying. It was just like very difficult. He looked at me and he was like, do you really need a job? And I said, yes sir. He said, come with me. I'm telling you it was around 10 p.m. So we start walking as we're going upstairs. And he's telling me, look, I don't know why I'm doing this, but you better don't be lying to me. Do you really need the job? And I say, I swear, I really need the job. It's like, okay, this is what we're going to do. Um, my name is Jose Ochoa. You better remember that name. Okay, okay. He was like, we're going to go upstairs right now. We're going to go to my boss's office. He's right there. And we're going to tell him that I know you. Uh, how do I know you? Uh, just tell him, I know. Tell him, your dad is my neighbor. 
and you're looking for a job and you want to apply here, okay? Well, okay. And he was like, and I live close to Plaza and Valley. So tell him that you know, you know, because we're neighbors and we live by Plaza and Valley. Okay, okay. So I hope you can understand. I was starving. I didn't eat for two days. I just had three slices of pizza. My body's finally recovering, starting to work again. And I had to memorize all that information. But I was like, I'm gonna do it. I got there, he knocks at the door, be like, hey Ben, how are you Ben? Um, here's my uh, friend's son, and he really needs a job. So I was wondering if you can just hire him or something. He was like, let me talk to him, close the door. So where do you know Jose? And I was like, oh, um, he's my neighbor, you know, it's my dad's neighbor, so I get to see him as I have to. Like, okay, so where do your dad live? Like, you know, over there by Plaza and Valley, so I get to see him pretty often, and he's pretty close to my dad, so yeah. Like, oh yeah, yeah, Jose, Jose lives by Plaza and Valley, I remember that now. He's like, so do you really need a job? And I say, yes. He's like, when can you start? And I say, right now. He's like, well... I'm gonna need all your paperwork and I'm gonna need to fill this application. The situation here is that I need somebody who's willing to work. Uh, I was previously abused at work with this other lady who stole all the money from me, who I worked for free. So I had to be honest with I look at him and I was like, I'm in the process of fixing my legal situation here. It's right now. Don't have papers. I think that was the hardest thing to do in my life. Knowing that I needed the job so bad, knowing that that was my only opportunity to survive in America. And I had to be honest with Ben and tell him, don't have papers. In waiting for God to touch this man's heart, he let me get a job either way. He looked at me like, but do you want to work? And I said, yes. I'm like, okay. This is what I can do for you. You will work two shifts a day. That means you will start 8 a.m. and you will finish 10 p.m. every day. And I am just gonna pay you $8 an hour. Only for the first eight hours. The second shift, I won't pay you. Deal? I didn't think twice. I said, deal. That was my daily schedule. Working 16 hours a day, getting paid out, just paid for eight hours, eight dollars an hour. I was happy. I was happy. Came out walk away from Ben's office. Jose look at me. Jose so check like, what happened? Jose so got a job. He celebrated, he buy me a Coke. He gave me a ride home. Such a good angel. Such a good angel. Next day, woke up five in the morning, together at 7 a.m. At the University of Austin. Made out of time. I remember getting there and then he was like, I go to Ben's office. Um, and he looked at me and he was like, You have breakfast? I was like, Yeah, yeah, don't worry. I'm ready to work. He was like, Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, let me take you and show you where you're going to be cleaning toilets, where you're going to be vacuuming the floor. I'm going to show you that. I was like, Sure, sure. And um, I remember that day he was like, Come with me. I, I haven't needed it. Let me, let, let me go, have, I need to have breakfast. I'm starving. Come with me, let's go to McDonald's. I will buy you something. 
I will pay for that. So we went to McDonald's. I was very happy. And we had breakfast. What can you tell me about this place? Well, here we're at UT, University of Texas. And that's the building, that's the library where I used to work. I used to work 16 to 20 hours a day. That's the library, uh, PCL, it's called PCL. And over here, crossing the street, that is the Wendy's. That's the place that really helped me to survive because at the beginning when I didn't have any money, I used to buy the chili they sell for one dollar, so that was my meal for today. That would help me to survive. And I used to work over there, vacuuming the uh, carpets and, you know, cleaning toilets and all kind of like things that you do on, on um, housekeeping. So I used to do a lot over there. Then I would come and eat over here on Wendy's and that would be my food. So, you know, a lot of memories. Very good people. I, I met very good people here. I like the people they work with and even the students were very nice. So yeah, it feels good to be back. So hey, we're back at UT now. Did you want to go to Wendy's and get some chili? <laughs> no. I had plenty. I ate all the chili possible for me, so <laughs> let's give it a chance to our students to have some chili. <laughs> Something different. I started in a cleaning toilets, I started like vacuuming the floors at the uh, University of Texas at the PCL, the public library, and it was awesome. Gave me a new opportunity to survive in the United States. I worked there for about six months. By my first three months, I was already uh, the manager of the cleaning staff. I was responsible about the chemicals and, you know, all the tools and everything we needed to be cleaning the building. So I saw, I saw God's hand in my life. And after doing all of that, I remember one day getting there, still sleeping on the floor in the living room. And one of the girls who was living in one of the rooms in that apartment, she had a boyfriend and they were gonna get married. So she moved with him and she wasn't gonna be using her room. So she looked at me and she's like, hey, um, I'm gonna be using my room. I'm gonna be leaving. I'm gonna go and live with my boyfriend before we get married, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I noticed that you don't have a room. Would you like to rent mine? You just pay me cash, you will stay there. It was like, wow, such a big opportunity. And I was like, yeah, yeah, I will let you know tomorrow. Of course, I wanted to do it, but I didn't have any money to pay for the rent yet. Next day, this is my second day at work. I have no money, no food, and I got an offer to get one of the rooms in the apartment, but I didn't have any money to pay for rent. So on my second day, I got there, I was starving, and if there was the uh, anniversary of the company where I was working for the cleaning service. That was the anniversary, and they make a big party. They did a lunch for everybody, so I ate. But the amazing thing here, like they give us a HEB gift card for $50. Do so you know what I mean? Food. So with those $50, I was so happy that I spent all the money just in food to be able to survive for 15 days because they pay every every other week over there. So every two weeks I would receive my paycheck. So that was enough money to make it for two weeks. Then my co-workers, uh, they were like, hey, search we want to invite you this, um, we're doing something where every two weeks you put $100 and we put all the money together and we give it to somebody. And then we're doing that with each one of those. Um, so you want to start, you want to join us. And I was like, sure. And they were like, you can be first if you want. That will be uh, $600. And we can start today when we're getting paid. 
and that's the money they needed to pay the apartment. So basically everything was just getting together perfectly fine, everything was sitting at the right point, it was just amazing. So I was able to, so I was able to get the apartment, pay her my first paycheck, which was the 600 I got from everybody who paid there. And I started doing my way over there. Go to the routine, which was very straightforward, which was waking up, going to work, coming back, taking a shower, put back my uniform. I put back my uniform and go and sleep with my uniform. Because in that way, I would say 20, 30 minutes. It was amazing for me to sleep those extra 20, 30 minutes. So I was sleeping four hours a day. So one day I remember I woke up and I was ready to go. I was already with my old dress and ready to go. I was all dressed with my uniform. So I woke up, I run, I walk something like about a mile to get to the bus station. But that day it was a little bit late. I saw the bus right there. So I started running and running and running and running to get there. But as I was running, my body started feeling weird and I started seeing these black spots in my eyes. And as I was seeing these black spots, I started running and I couldn't stop my body. So I just went and boom, I hit on the side of the bus. And when I hit the side of the bus, I just fell down. So do you see that blue bus? That's the bus station. So I used to walk all that distance every day, 5.55 in the morning, running over here to get that bus station. One time, I was very tired. I worked for 16 hours. That day I didn't eat because I didn't have any money. So I went straight to sleep. I woke up, I ran. Like I really ran so fast, all that distance. Apparently when I was getting to the bus, I couldn't stop my body. I started seeing like, flashes like black flashes in my eyes and my body wasn't responding to the point that I hit the bus like I literally hit with my face the bus and I fell on the ground and nobody and I fell to the ground and literally nobody helped me I started seeing like stars and everything it's because I was very very weak and I remember the bus just leaving and I stay on the floor like literally on the floor for like two three minutes until my body like start like getting back, you know, I don't know. And it's finally when I came back home. Like, but that's showing you how weak I was, how tired I was. And even though I was feeling like that, there was no other option but keep working, you know, and keep fighting for your dreams. I remember just being very, very dizzy, feeling horrible. And as, it took me like 10 to 20 minutes to get up. I swear, 10 to 20 minutes. It was so hard, my body wasn't responding. I got up and he's there when I was like, I won't be able to do this job that long. A few days later, I was working and Jose Ochoa calls me and he's like, hey, so remember you told me you used to like paint cars and things like that? I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I like, whoa, in the morning, I have another job, which is like working with cabinets. You know, I, I put the cabinets together, we paint them and everything. And I heard the boss, he was saying that he uh, needs a painter. And I remember you know how to paint cars. So if you know how to paint cars, you will know how to paint cabinets. He's like, why, why you just don't come? You have to come right now and talk to him. I will tell him. So don't forget, Jose Ochoa was the one who referred me to my first job. And he was doing the same one with the second job. So I was like, but well, what am I going to say about work? Just tell Ben that you have something to do. You forgot something in the apartment, so you have to go and come back. So that's exactly what I did. I took the bus, I got home, changed, and when I was ready to go, there, was, there were no, like, buses who were going all the way outside because it was outside of the city of Austin. So I literally walk. I was so red. I changed my shirt three times because they were soaking wet. So as soon as I got there, I called to the channel like I'm right here. 
So like, come, 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 come inside. So I got there and I met Paul Myers, this German guy who had his own shop. He looked at me and he was like, so I heard you're the painter. I was like, yes. I was like, are you sure you can do this? And I was like, yeah, do you speak English? And I was like, yeah, I mean, I do speak English. He was like, well, look, I need somebody to speak English because I need to talk to you all the time about what kind of color, what kind of paint, and what kind of job do we need to do. So we're just gonna have an interview. And if I see that your English is not that good, we're gonna stop the interview. And we don't waste your time, we don't waste my time, okay? And I was like, okay. So I was very, very nervous. The interview went great. So he was like, okay, you got a job. So finally, I got a job where they were gonna pay me for every hour that I work, $14 an hour. So I came outside, was just very, very happy, excited. When I started working with Paul Myers, I started painting and they were paying me, everything was great. But then it was something in my heart. I need to study. I really need to study. And it's there when I focus and I was like, I need to study. So I went to Austin Community College. And I went to get information. I was like, hey, I really want to study English. And I want to know what kind of programs you have. They're like, well, we have programs for the community. Right now we're going to have uh, this program, which is for um, ESOL, something like that was the program. ESOL program. But right now, we're gonna have a test for 500 people, but we're just gonna take 100 from there. Do you wanna do it? So when I asked, most of the people who was gonna take the test, people who was married to American citizens, people who was here when they were, you know, they came to the United States when they were 13, 12 years old, and they needed that extra um, help on classes to learn English better. So, I say yes, I enroll, the test was the next day, and I remember getting to my house and be like, what is the point for me to get there if I have no chances? Like there are 500 people, so many of them are married with American citizens, they're already practicing English, and I'm just here, I just learned from Netflix, and I wasn't feeling confident. But then, the story of David and Goliath hit my head, you know, how David, who was that little skinny guy who was just taking care of the sheep, of all the animals that his father had, how he was one day bringing the lunch to the war zone to his siblings, and he saw his siblings and everybody, which they were soldiers, very scared of Goliath and even though in reality he wasn't on the same level that his siblings which they were trained to fight they were trained to like be on war and how David was just taking care of animals and how his siblings had the right tools the right equipment to be on a war and David didn't have anything I was still when Goliath was scaring everybody still look at them and he like I will fight him and he grabbed three stones he killed Goliath that story hit my head one night before going to do the test and I was like David made it I want to do it too so next morning I woke up I went over there and there were five five or six classrooms full of students, all the people were gonna do, there were like 500 people. So I was sitting right next to this French woman who was married to an American citizen. And we started doing the test. And after two, three hours, we did the test. They would take the test, they would just scan it on the computer to see the results. And then they started saying, who searched your DS? They started asking in every single classroom. And I was like, oh my God. They're gonna be like, why did you come to the test if you don't know in English, you know? So when they were asking, calling my name, I got so nervous. And I was like, hell no, I'm not gonna say I'm Sergio Diaz. So I started asking and they came into my classroom. They're like, who is Sergio Diaz? Who is Sergio Diaz? And I was all quiet and nervous. I'm like, I'm not gonna say I'm Sergio Diaz. 
So the French woman next to me, she looked at my face and said, You are Sir Julius. He is Sir Julius, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, Great. So he was like, Are you Sir Julius? Are you Sir Julius? Well, you didn't tell me you were Sir Julius. And I was like, Oh, sorry, sorry. I was like distracted or something. He was like, Come with me. I was like, Holy crap. And I go over there, I walk to the front of the room. And I was like, That's it. He's gonna just tell me, Please leave or something. You know, like, what is in your head? Go back home. I'm like, I don't know. I was just thinking so many things. And I looked at me and he was like, Congratulations, you're the highest score of the 500 people. You don't have to pay for anything. You're gonna have full coverage on your tuition. You're good to go. I was like, what? First place of 500 people? was it when I got there? So, I cried. I walked back home and couldn't believe something amazing was happening. Um, I remember getting home, I was very, very, very happy. A few days later, I went to like enroll in class. And when I got there, I started enrolling and doing everything. They were like, yeah, you're good. Uh, it's gonna be $250. And I was like, wait, what? They were like, yeah, it's gonna be $250. And I was like, no, 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 no. I got the highest score and they told me I'm not gonna pay anything. She was like, no, no, yeah, for your tuition. You need to pay for books on. It's $250 for this book. And I was like, oh, but I don't have $250. She was like, you need a book. It's required to come start class. Is there when I was like, that's it. Going back to reality. So I walk back to my room, go to my apartment. I was very frustrated and I just started crying. I remember walking back to my apartment, very sad. I started crying. The reality hit me again, which was don't have money to study. So I remember crying and just praying to God and telling him, please help me. I need you to help me. I really want to study. And I was crying. And suddenly I received a phone call. They're like, I speak with Sergio Diaz. I was like, yes, it's Sergio Diaz. They're like, okay, we're calling from the department's office. We talked to uh, Marisol. She said she's renting you the room. I was like, yeah, yeah. So they said, well, we have a new owner and he wants to do things the right way. He wants to start over. He has a new administration, a new, a new management, and they want to give you the deposit back. So if you can come back for $240, we're here at the office if you can come and pick it up today. I needed to pay $235 for my books. I was like, what? So she say everything again. And I started crying like a baby. I cried so hard. The only words were coming out of my mouth was, thank you, God. My name is Oscar and I got to meet Sergio Diaz Checo. 
we call him Checo. Uh, I got to meet him in uh, Austin Community College. Uh, we were taking network security classes. And uh, he was uh, one of those students who would always ask questions, always take notes. And the cool thing about him that uh, was that he would always teach you, you know. Um, I know I had a lot of questions. I would go up to him and be like, hey, Sergio, how do you do this? How do you do that? And he would take out his notes, like, okay, you go like this, 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 this. I'm like, man, you know. And so he was a great student. Um, a lot of my classmates would go with him, uh, ask him, like, how do you, you know, like, how do you solve this uh, question? And if he didn't know the answer, he would always get it one way or the other. He would always find the answer. Um, and he was really proactive uh, throughout college. He was really proactive, always looking uh, for ways to improve himself uh, or get better grades. And um, he was always uh, a hard worker when it came to that. Um, so that's where we met. We would go to uh, get tacos um, when we would hang out or uh, we would go to Kirby Lane. That was one of his uh, uh, favorite restaurants when it came to breakfast, Kirby Lane. You know, we'd say, hey, let's go to Kirby Lane. I'm like, okay, let's go. So we'd go there and he already knew the, 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 the workers that worked there. Um, and it's because of his, uh, of his character. He's really outgoing, friendly, uh, kind. I think that's one of his greatest virtues, being kind. Uh, kind to others and making them feel like people um, and that's something I, I really see a lot that he does you know make, making people feel like people like they're important no matter what you're doing he he talks to you you know like, like you're an actual person um, so his story was was, uh, was really uh, incredible because you know it's a story I can relate you know and I admire him a lot uh, what he's at you know not not anyone can say, you know, uh, that they've accomplished the things that they want to accomplish. Usually our goals are progressive. Well, he's already passed a lot of these goals and he's always shooting for more, uh, which I, you know, I see that a lot. Like, man, you know, he did this, he did that. I'm like, wow, you know, that's incredible. Uh, someone that accomplishes goals, uh, he's that person. Friends as well. He treats friends like family. Like, to him, there's no such thing as friends. To him, there's more like family, you know? Everyone's a family. And uh, that's really, uh, that's, a, that's really kind of him, you know? Uh, because when, when you talk to him, you're comfortable to talk to him. You're comfortable speaking about, you know, maybe issues that you're going through or, or, or if you're down, like he, one way or the other, he always brings you back up, encourages you and uh, supports you, you know, he motivates you to do better. Uh, and, you know, that's something that I was going through some phases in my life and he was there to help me out. So, uh, you know, thank you for that, Sergio. Uh, you've helped me, although you may not know it, you've helped me several times.